Welcome to Agatha Christie, She Watched, our spoiler-heavy look at the movie and TV adaptations of the mystery genre's greatest writer. I'm Bill Peschel of Peschel Press, publisher of the annotated novels of Agatha Christie, including today's movie, which is a movie in which we're talking about Scarlet Pimpernels, Belgian refugees, blown marriage proposals, and spill vases. It's The Mysterious Affair at Styles the first novel by Agatha Christie from the Poirot TV series starring David Suchet. But first, let me introduce my partner in marriage, as well as crime of the fictional kind, Teresa Paschal. Hello, Teresa. Hi! It's always a pleasure to be here with you. And we I do want to make a note of saying this, but apparently uh, someone commented that we do not provide the movie as part of our YouTube channel, uh, podcast reviews and the reason why we don't do this is because it is copyright infringement and so we suggest you get the movies the same way we did which is we go down to the library and if the library doesn't have it we get it through the interlibrary loan or many of these are available through amazon prime which gives you a link to is it called britbox am i saying it right yeah, Brit britbox box. where they have a ton of this stuff available but your library can help you and so can BritBox, and that way you can legitimately get the movie because we aren't going to post it. Yes, just because you see clips and sometimes whole movies on other channels doesn't mean we can do it. It's called copyright infringement. And well, as... and, and two cease and desist letters were enough. We're not... That was for uh, comics out of context, but you know, we're not doing this. We're not, we don't want to do this. Yes, we have to be very careful. But anyway, we are talking about Agatha Christie's debut novel published in 1920, still in copyright in the UK and the European Union, out of copyright in the US, which is why we have the complete annotated Mysterious Affair at Styles available from Peschel Press. That's right. And it, this is just as readable a novel as it was the day she wrote it. Bill and I were talking a little bit earlier about how the vast majority of books that are coming out in that tsunami of swill on an hourly basis, they're all forgettable. And it really does take somebody special to rise up from that overwhelming tidal wave of books, and Agatha managed it right out of the starting gate. She really is a genius, and this novel is just as readable as the day it was written. But I suggest you get the annotated version, because then you'll learn what a spills vase actually is and why it mattered so much here. But she, she started working out her tropes right away. She had written before, but I don't think she had ever published anything. She had never published a short story. This was her first published anything. She was starting to work out what she wanted in a detective. She used Poirot. He was a Belgian refugee. And at the time that she was writing Styles, they, were, they had been busy fighting the war. She knew Belgian refugees in Torquay. A Belgian policeman seemed like something that would be interesting. It would attract reader attention. She gave him his Watson in terms of Hastings. She started working out English country house murders. She knew enough about poisons from working in the dispensary that she knew that if you put in uh, bromine, bromide? Bromide, yeah. Bromide into a strychnine health tonic. And yes, folks, they really did use strychnine and health tonics at the time. And because she couldn't write a courtroom scene, her publisher didn't like it, she developed the Poirot, which is, has become, of course, one of the archetypical things that a detective does, where the, the detective and every policeman and detective in the entire world probably secretly wishes they could do this. But you gather all the suspects, they all have to listen to you quietly and shut up while they are listening, and then you get to say everything that happened, you're the center of attention, and you prove your brilliance by deciding who did it and why. That was Agatha Christie's, one of her signal contributions to the mystery genre. And it was because she didn't know enough law to be able to have Poirot testify from the witness stand. So she had to come up with something else. And if you think this is just us coming up with this trope, it turns out in one of the Fables comic book series, and Fables is a great series, by the way, if you like seeing how fairy tales are, are adapted for the modern day. Oh, it's Bill Willingham is is the uh, artist, the writer. writer he, no, he's artist. the writer. Oh, they, the used, they changed our oh, artists throughout right. the series. They changed artists throughout the series, but he was the writer. But yes, Big V. Wolf said, I want to do this. <laughs> I am going to get everybody together and I'm going to tell everybody who done it and why I figured it out and I'm going to show off. 
Right. So let's go ahead and get started with Styles itself, with the TV version, because this is one of, if you remember right, you said this was one of two Poirot episodes that are set mostly in the past, not in the mid-30s. That's right. When ITV started doing, and I think it was ITV, when ITV started the Poirot TV series, uh, the first episode that they did was an hour long, The Clapham Cook. And they made, they used some of the very early stories. And every year, because I read David Suchet's memoir of being Poirot, every year it was kind of a toss-up as to whether or not they would continue on the series. And that's why it took so long. They spent just shy of 25 years filming the episodes. They made the decision from the very beginning that they were going to set all of the episodes in and around 1935, say from about 1934 to 1936, whatever time the story was written in. And so they had to make adaptations as they went along for anachronisms and continuity and other things like that. But when you film a big TV series all in the same little window of time, a two-year stretch of time, you're able to use the same wardrobe, you're able to use the same cars, you're able to use the same set design. It makes a lot of things a lot easier. And then you don't have to worry about the actors slowly aging like Tommy and Tuppence do, where they start out as, you know, they're 22 and they end up at 72. So ITV started with the short stories and they did a full season with just short stories then they started doing the novels and you would get one or two novels a year as a movie the episodes are all 52 minutes long but the movies are longer and they really did a beautiful job all of the movies and all of the episodes with the exception of two were moved into 1935 and the two exceptions were the mysterious affair at styles because it sets up how poirot and hastings reconnected at the styles country house because poirot was a belgian refugee and it takes place in 1917 they actually give you the date so it's over the summer of 1917 the great war is still in full swing the other episode that takes place outside of this time period and it takes place earlier before the great war is the chocolate box and that's largely showing one of Poirot's first most important cases as a young Belgian policeman before the Great War. Oh my God, they did such a beautiful job with styles. And there's so much in the background that says, this isn't 1935. This is, 19, this is 1917. The clothes, the cars, the fact that the war is going on. And so pretty much every man that you see is older. There are no young men available because they're all off fighting. And in, if you pay close attention to some of the background scenes, you'll see three or four young women struggling with unloading feed sacks from wagons, doing all of the hard, heavy work that the men would have done, but now, they're, now they are all off fighting the war. The Great House of Styles, they're careful with their candles they have scenes shot at dinner where the dining room is only lit with a few branches of candles because that's all you can afford. John Cavendish points out that he still gets petrol for the car because he has to inspect all of the local farms for 20 miles around, and he has to have petrol to do that, and that's why he actually has gasoline in his car. There's so many details of that period that were there. There's a scene where we run across Poirot leading a group of other Belgian refugees through the woods, and they run across the home guard rehearsing in the woods, and every one of those men is older. Yeah. You know, they're in their 40s and 50s and 60s and even older, and they are home because they're too old, they're too sick, or they have critical functions, like they're the town doctor, and... Well, that's what you do. That's where we get the introduction to Poirot because they're in the woods and they're they're in uniform and they're firing and they're shooting and you hear explosions and then you hear somebody shouting, cease fire! And then you see Poirot's feet in his patent leather shoes. And, and these spats. Are, and spats. And he carefully picking his way through, through the, the mud. Through the mud, trying not to get his shoes dirty to point out this plant the Scarlet to, Pimpernel. The Scarlet Pimpernel to his fellow Belgian refugees. There's like seven or eight of them, and they all look Belgian. They're all wearing kind of the same clothes, and they obviously look foreign. 
And you know how this is a flower that only opens when the weather is going to be prolonged sunshine, but Poirot makes an English weather joke about how this rarely happens in England. Let me mention for those of you who uh, are thinking of something different, they are talking about the flower here and not Baroness Orxy's hero, Sir Percival, who was the Scarlet Pimpernel and the basis for every worthless waste of space fop by day and superhero by night. Which in a way could also be a nice touch to apply to Poirot as well because he's making himself out as a comic foreigner but yet he is a very sharp man as well and his manners to somebody who doesn't know his reputation can be very disarming oh yes and he uses that and and you know that's a really nice point because you're right Poirot does exemplify some of the aspects of the Scarlet Pimpernel and it's almost like a little sly joke there if you want it you don't have to notice it that he is two people he's the one that is this comic foreigner who doesn't speak the language that well and who's better dressed than every anyone else in the room to the point of being overly fussy about his appearance yet at the same time he is a crusader for justice Mm -hmm. absolutely a crusader for justice yeah and because this is kind of like the introduction of poirot they emphasize his his desire for for order. order. You know, he's advising the shopkeeper that maybe she should arrange her groceries by the direction of where they come from. So the spices come from the Orient. Well, you put them on the east side of the shop. (laughs) And she's not having none of that. And, you know, it had just occurred to me while you were saying that, that again, thinking about Poirot's OCD and David Suisse does such a beautiful job of bringing it out. I wonder if it, they didn't exaggerate it in styles. And, you know, a sensitive scriptwriter might have thought of this. You think about Poirot, a refugee who has always wanted to control his surroundings and every single part of his life has been upended. And the only thing he has left anymore is controlling what he can around him. Like and that. if yeah, he is, nice yeah, if he's ultra controlling, if he's ultra organized, if he's ultra precise, this is all he has left to hold on to. You know, he's been put in that snow globe and shaken up vigorously and then dumped out onto the ground and he, and you don't even hardly know where you are and you're surrounded by people who talk funny and dress funny and eat uh, funny stuff that usually tastes is usually does not taste very good and has been badly prepared. That's right. He can't go into the pub because he's not he's just not used to English beer. Yes, he is not going to drink that stuff, although the other Belgian refugees are perfectly fine with drinking that crappy warm English beer because who cares? it's beer (laughs) well and his desire for order and neatness also plays a role in the solution to the mystery as well when he discovers that something has been moved that he had put back into place and 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 in a supposedly closed room where no one went right so he knew immediately and this is in near the climax when uh hastings and again this is this is hastings traditional role to say something dopey or to say something mundane, and then Poirot smacks his forehead, bull, and, <laughs> and says, oh my God, Hastings, you have saved me again, yep. because you have said something obvious and mundane, and now I'm having to reassess what happened. To get into the story itself, for those of you who haven't read it, Hastings is back from the war. He's been wounded, not too badly, but he has been wounded enough that he's back in London, and he's in this convalescent home convalescent home that's right yes it was obviously uh and this happened quite a lot it was one of the great mansions of england that had been taken over by the government and turned into a convalescent home because of course they had they must have had thousands of wounded soldiers being trekked being shipped back to england on a regular basis so they could be patched up and then sent back out to the front to show you it's during wartime he's actually in a room with a bunch of other wounded soldiers and they're watching newsreel footage from the front and this is a combination of actual wartime footage as well as i think movie footage as well but it's very well from period movies from period movies it's very well put together oh yeah you don't think about it as being some of it must have been hollywood magic and not not actual film footage. I, I don't know. I would have to look it up. Well, something like the tank approaching the camera that's in the trench and then going over the trench doesn't sound like something that they would be filming on a real battlefield. Yeah, but probably there were not. enough of, of men firing and running off into the distance and falling over and not getting up 
And I've seen some some stills from uh, my history books showing that, you know, the whistle in which they all go up the slope of the trench and then some of them fall back because, well, they're dead. They're dead. And yes. you have to wonder, is this really recovering? Is this how you treat <laughs> Are you really shell treating shock? shell shock by so she- showing film footage of a battlefield? Is this really helpful? And I... I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if this was something they made up for the movie or if this was something they were taking as a as an actual period yeah. uh, therapy. Because remember, these are people who use strychnine as a health tonic. When we did the annotated version, we had our kids read the uh, books and they were uniformly horrified. You took strychnine as a health tonic? Isn't it like poisonous he said well yes actually is but the dose makes the poison and strychnine you did a lot of research for this yeah Stry- i actually write about strychnine in the book so strychnine is it's similar to caffeine in some of its effects so it's it's a very it's a uh, it, affects, it's, it affects the nerves which is why you get the caffeine jitters well when you take strychnine you get a lot more of those <laughs> and you especially get, if you get too much <laughs> you get too much and you actually your face breaks out into kind of like this joker like grin uh rice's sardonicus i think it's called Mm -hmm. and your back is arched and i mean literally arched in death and it cannot be put down until the rigor mortis kind of passes eventually it is it's a nasty way to die yeah the way even the way they showed it is still not even a patch on just how terrible it acts on the body how terrible how painful how agonizing but in a diluted form it does act as a tonic it's you know it's a pick-me-up like cup of coffee although again you know i have to wonder i always notice this when i see this in uh the movies she's taking this stimulating tonic before she goes to bed they're all having a cup of coffee after dinner before they go to bed if i had caffeine like that i wouldn't be able to sleep at all and all i can think is this must be english coffee and so it has been diluted so much that it has less caffeine than green tea I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. And it doesn't make any sense to me that you would have your strychnine and your health tonic that you would take before going to bed. Now, if it's going to be mildly stimulating, why aren't you taking it in the morning so that you have some energy to get through to through the day? But I don't know. So anyway, Hastings is at the convalescent home. He meets John Cavendish. Cavendish invites him up to Stiles St. Mary, where, by the way, Poirot is already residing with a bunch of Belgian refugees, thanks to... Mrs. Inglethorpe. Mrs. Inglethorpe. Yes, Mrs. Inglethorpe was kind enough to arrange housing for Belgian refugees. And on the drive down, John Cavendish tells Hastings all about that interloper that my mother married. Alfred. She married Alfred Inglethorpe. You could say that Emily Cavendish was a catch she was an older widow wealthy big house the uh, what man on the make wouldn't want to service this old lady in exchange for the potential of wealth right 20 years younger yeah like 20 years younger 40s she must be in her 60s late 50s maybe i would guess if John Cavendish has not been on, gone off to the war and Lawrence has not gone off to the war, they might be both in their 30s. But I would guess that Emily Inglethorpe was in her 60s. And, and when you're 60 years old, you still think of yourself as being 18 inside. You really do. And you have this man paying attention to you. And he says all the right things. And as you find out later on, he knows the right things to say because he has been coached and again you don't see this and this is another one of agatha's favorite tropes that she uses many many times there is a hidden couple in this film a hidden couple it is not revealed until the end and then you can suddenly see why alfred inglethorpe was able to move in so well he'd been coached on what to say and what to do to charm emily cavendish inglethorpe and we do see that by the way there there's the tea on the on the uh, lawn in which he's um, arranging her cushions and arranging her schedule as well he acts as her secretary oh yes he is so helpful he is so useful to her it is amazing which is kind of amazing as well considering he's this balding man who with his huge beard he's not very what you would call handsome he he has this very kind of stoic look about him almost fussy yeah you know he seems like a fussy confirmed bachelor and he would be irritating to live with but he is not he does everything for emily inglethorpe and she loves it yep and the rest of the family hates it oh my god her two sons john who inherits everything and lawrence the spare 
they deeply resent Alfred Inglethorpe, and John in particular has a really good reason for resenting him. And that is because Emily redid the will, and so John in inherits the properties. As the oldest son, you would expect that he would inherit the properties, which are probably also entailed, but he doesn't get the money to maintain them. Oh no, the money is going to go to dear Alfred. And you can't maintain properties without money. And I can't remember did, if they had death duties in 1917 or not. But if they did, John would have really been in the soup when his mother died. Because if he didn't inherit the money to pay the death duties, he would have to do something else to come up with the money. Right, which I think he does. It's Lawrence who's a writer and apparently not a very good one. He does some articles, but he's not really... He's, he needs the money to live off of. And I know John and Mary are living off her as well. Yeah, they're living off of her as well. But again, somebody has to run the estate. He's acting in the capacity as a steward running the estate that he's going to inherit. And again, what else is he supposed to do? Somebody has to be there to run the estate and the home farm. And there's probably, even though you don't see it, there's going to be land that is being farmed that is connected to uh, styles. That's just the way it works. Right. So to round out the rest of the family, we have, of course, we have John and Lawrence. We have Cynthia Murdoch, who's a house guest there. Yes, she apparently is a poor relation of Emily Inglethorpe. And there's this, this scene where she's talking to Hastings, where what am I going to do? Because Emily Inglethorpe had said, you will be provided for. And for a young lady who has a typical young lady's education, but she's been brought up a certain way and she has no family left. Uh, no marketable up, skills. And no marketable skills, no up close family and no money. What is she supposed to do? She's going to become a governess or a companion and live that, that half life, not quite a servant, but certainly not one of the family. And she really is in a bind. Mm -hmm. Marrying Lawrence for her was a step up. Uh, there's at well, least, she hasn't married Lawrence. Yeah, she hasn't married Lawrence, although apparently she's going to at the end. You also have Mary Cavendish, and we don't see as much of Mary as I would have liked. A lot of times they told us what was going on instead of showing us what was going on. But apparently Mary is passionately in love with John, but at the same time she is furiously jealous of any woman that he looks at. And he has been spending some time with redheaded hot Mrs. Rakes, and what a great name, Mrs. Rakes, in the village and Mary is very, very jealous of this. Because and Mrs. Rakes is a widow. Yes, Mrs. Rakes way. is a widow. I would have liked to have seen more of the script devoted to why John lent the money to Mrs. Rakes. And if I recall from the novel, and it's been a while, but I knew the novel really, really well when we did the annotation. John had reasons for doing this that did not involve setting Mrs. Rakes up as his mistress. Like he was a friend of her dead husband or... Uh, she had children, she needed to do X. I don't know, but the film did a really bad job of setting up why John did this. All you know is that John loaned her the money, but you don't get any explanation. And considering how many times we got this long pan of styles coming in, and I mean, it's a beautiful house and I enjoyed looking at it. I would have appreciated a few lines of dialogue. Finally, we have Evie Howard, who is the factotum. And this is one of those words that Christy used in the book that I had to look up, which is from the Latin. And she is helping to run the household. Yes, she is a combination companion to Emily Inglethorpe. She is a paid friend. She is a personal secretary. She is a personal assistant. Emily Inglethorpe needs to have something done. Evie does it for her. And for an older woman with no family to provide for her, she's single, no money of her own. Being a personal secretary companion to a rich woman is your career path. That's just what happens. Evie would have been brought up properly so she would know the right way to write letters to everyone. She would know people. She would basically make Emily Inglethorpe's life as the lady of the greatest lady in the district she would make her life easier in every single way does uh, emily inglethorpe need a sp scarf because it's the it's starting to get chilly evie will run into the house and get one does she need her tonic evie will run and get it does she need to write letters to the next 50 people on the food chain lower down about why they need to participate in the FET so that they can rebuild the walls of the church. Evie is going to be the one who handwrites all those letters 
so that Emily Inglethorpe can sign them. Right. And she's finding herself displaced by the introduction of Alfred Inglethorpe into the household and is railing against him from the beginning of the episode. Oh, yes. Almost to the point of parody about that man. And you could look at it as she is jealous. Emily Inglethorpe is having a man pay attention to her. She's jealous of the fact that Evie is no longer the most important person in Emily's life. You can say that she's worried about her own position, which you could also see. But what you find out is that Evie has an ulterior motive for doing this, which is that somehow along the line, she must have met Alfred Inglethorpe and fan fiction writers like fire up your laptops. She met Alfred Inglethorpe, fell madly in love with him, and they started working out a plan where Alfred would marry Mrs. Cavendish, the widowed Mrs. Cavendish, and eventually, if, if she didn't reach an early grave all on her own, they would work so that she did reach an early grave while leaving huge quantities of money to Alfred, and then Evie and Alfred would quietly get married and move someplace else and live live happily ever after. And, you know, I'm suddenly realizing that this is death on the Nile. Yeah. This is death on the Nile. <laughs> <Spoiler> where... <laughs> like I said, this is spoiler heavy here. This is something she uses. The hidden couple is used in a lot of her books. Oh, yes. But this is death on the but Nile. This is death on the Nile. Where you have Jackie and Simon. Uh, you know, uh, Lynette sees Simon and says, oh, I want you. And Simon says to Jackie, you know, if I married her and killed her, we'd be rich. And That's Jackie right. says, you know, you're right, but let me plan this because you'd get caught instantly. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's not exactly the same, but this is Death on the Nile and a dozen other novels where you have the hidden couple pulling strings. And so everything that you think you know, you don't. Yeah. And they're not always nefarious as well. They're just sometimes like in uh, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. It provides an alternative motive where you have the of the Ursula son. the Pyler maid and yeah. Ralph Payton, the adopted stepson that they got married and that leads to all kinds of trouble for Ralph. Yes, all kinds of soap opera complications where he's being forced into an engagement to a an stepfather's choice of bride, that is his his uh, cousin, although they're not related genetically. And when is he going to man up and say <laughs> to Roger Ackroyd, Hey, I'm already married to the parlor maid? <laughs> So you have the setup there, and because Hastings is on the scene, of course, he's he's staying at the house, so he gets to see all this. And then he runs into Poirot purely by accident. In the village. And, and then, then yeah. Mrs. Inglethorpe dies mysteriously. And so Poirot is introduced into the household because John Cavendish, you know, bless him, wanted to find out what happened. And he's willing to go against his brother, Lawrence, because Lawrence is all about, oh, it's got to be natural. It's got to be natural. Why do you want to do this? And and that's explained later on, because he's afraid that Cynthia poisoned Mrs. Inglethorpe, whether on purpose or by accident. But he is sure that Cynthia did this, and he is trying to protect Cynthia. Right. So he, even though he has medical training, he's basically making a fool of himself, because the doctor, that would be uh, okay. Dr. Wilkins, recognized immediately what was going on, because, again, strychnine was used commonly commonly as a health tonic, it is perfectly possible that Dr. Wilkins in medical school or in his practice would have seen people who took an overdose. He knew what he was looking at. Yeah, the symptoms can represent, back in the uh, 1856 with the William Palmer case, they were mistaking it for what's called apoplexy, which at the time was just a general catch-all term for any kind of seizure that ends in death. So doctors had a very, because there were some very notorious poisoning cases, arsenic and strychnine seemed to be the big two in Victorian England. Doctors had a very good idea of what, of what strychnine poisoning looked like. And I would guess that by this time, particularly because the chemist in the village had to have Alfred Inglethorpe sign his poison book, people already knew that it was poisonous. And it was acceptable for a doctor to prescribe a strychnine tonic, but they were very, very careful about how it was compounded because they, they all, everybody already knew it was bad for you. But people wanted it, and doctors will give you what you want. And they just wanted to make sure that you didn't poison yourself. But you could see that already the thinking was tw going towards, you know, maybe we shouldn't give this to people 
at all, even though we can prescribe it. Maybe we shouldn't. Even though it was still being prescribed as a tonic right up through World War II, because there's a Life magazine ad that I saw of this lovely grandma sitting with her happy children, her happy grandchildren, and it's something about, the uh, headline was something, enjoying the fruits of the Quaker nut tree, which is what was the tree that provided the strychnine in its nuts. Oh, yes, and that when you say Quaker nut, people don't think, Rat poison. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Something a little more sedate. The William Palmer case was absolutely amazing. For those of you who don't know your Victorian true crime, Agatha did know her Victorian true crime, and it was such a notorious case. It changed English case law, and that crime is one of the things that inspired Agatha and Dorothy Sayers and many other writers to use it as an idea, this, this strychnine poisoning. Yeah, because Dr. Palmer was this country physician in Rugeley, and I'll just give you the short bit of it. He poisoned a lot of people with strychnine, some of it in the pursuit of a payout from the life insurance companies, because life insurance was a relatively new thing and they had to learn how to protect themselves from people who would take out life insurance policies pay the first premium and then poison somebody and it was such a loose system that for example say i could take out a life insurance policy on my neighbor's kid <laughs> It, it was, was like really bedding. lax. It was really, really it was lax. Very lax. And once the <laughs> and once the policy came through and was accepted, well, you poison the kid, and then you call the insurance company and collect the payout. <laughs> and they already had insurance adjusters. And we learned all of this because Bill also, in addition to the annotation of the Agatha Christie's and the Dorothy Sayers, Bill did an annotation of three books about William Palmer: the trial transcript and Illustrated Life, which is a which proves that uh, newspapers produced quickie books to uh, ca to uh, uh, capitalize on something dramatic on William Palmer's life and a William Palmer bio. And if you're interested in Victorian true crime or how you can poison uh, babies with strychnine, well, there you go. That's how you can learn it. <laughs> Poirot was investigating. Yes, and he is sworn to be discreet. And this was something I noticed, too, because he has this wonderful kit, like a policeman's investigative kit a boy's sherlock holmes clue finding kit yeah, and we never that oh, was zipped up and we never saw it again yeah it we never see it again it was filled with wonderful things so that he could collect little samples so that he had little bags to put things in so that he could whip out the magnifying glass and examine something more closely and it's a beautiful i'm sure it was probably period correct beautiful beautiful a forensic lab in a leather binder case, and we never see it again. I don't remember seeing this in any Poirot episode, and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful kit. And, of course, Hastings is there helping him along the way, and we see more of their byplay back and forth. Including um, Hastings telling John Cavendish early on that, oh, yes, I learned from Poirot. I was involved in a case with him before the war, but I feel that I have moved past him in terms of knowledge. Yes, I have my methods. I want to be a private detective when the war is over, but I think I can be a better one than him. So already uh, Hastings <laughs> is delusional. <He's> already, <laughs> well, he was also delusional later in, when I think it was it was Cynthia Murdoch was complaining to him about what's going to become of me, what's, what's going to happen, and he proposes marriage to her. On the spot. <laughs> On the spot. But you know, Arthur Hastings, whatever else you can say about him, he's fundamentally an extremely decent, caring man. He yeah. may not be very bright. And there are sequences in this movie where you can see him kind of like starting to get the idea that everybody else is smarter than him and he feels just as dumb as a box of rocks. And wait a minute, what did I just miss? What just happened? Did I completely get that wrong? Yes, Poirot even goes into saying, we need to make our murderer feel that, that we are ineffectual and you will be good at that. <laughs> and he walks away and the camera stays on Hastings as you could see his brain processing that. Thinking, um, that wasn't complimentary, was that? <laughs> but over, overall, it's a great, it's a really wonderful episode. It's a great look into what day-to-day -day life 
was like during World War I. And I noticed all the people walking. There were people walking out of Styles and walking back. Uh, when he's, uh, no, it was Poirot going to town because he runs into Alfred Inglethorpe at the gates to Styles, and he's walking out, and Alfred was walking back from town. Oh, yes. Everybody walked miles, and that was part. that was partly because of the petrol rationing and partly because, as uh, uh, one of the Cavendishes says, all of the horses, other than those needed for agricultural purposes, had been requisitioned by the army, and so everybody walked. In fact, the only thing I would say, you know, again, I would say that you should have seen more people in the background with herds of sheep and moving cows along and moving geese and basically doing all of that kind of scut work. The village and uh, styles are both suspiciously clean, but wow, it just looks so great. It really does. And seeing a group of young women struggling to unload the feed sacks of grain from a wagon because there is no man around to do it. And that, that perfectly encapsulates what everybody had to do their bit. Several of the characters say this at various times. You know, we all have to do our part. We all have to do our part. In fact, see this in later on Poirot episodes when people are talking about their service during the Great War. Everyone had to do their part. And then when you see the Marple episodes whether it's Joan Hickson or uh, ITV's version in the 50s, oh yes, I had to do my part. Everybody did their part. And that actually becomes very important because there's a clue involving some green cloth that's the armband for a farm girl, which was a program that put women at work on the farms because the men folk are mostly off fighting in the war. And they were called land girls, and the armband helped distinguish them that they weren't just goofing off in the fields. They were doing all of the hard field work. And I remember that you found a poem written at the time about the incredible drudgery and how hard it was and you were freezing in the winter and roasting in the summer and it was damn hard work. And there were a lot of the young women who did this. They weren't farm girls. They were gentry girls. They were brought up to a completely different lifestyle. And then suddenly they're out there working with the turnips in the mud. Yeah, because this is a war in which, first of all, it had to be financed. It had to be paid for. You had to have people involved at every level of society involved in the work. And you don't see this. I don't think you probably have seen this since World War II in America. You know, with oh, Korea you have In Vietnam, you don't have that. You have people who serve, but you don't have the entire economy Revamping. I mean, when you watch the background scenes, you will see that uh, like military vehicles or the ambulances, they're being driven by women yeah. because the man who would have done that job is off fighting or dead. Yeah. And part of what Britain had to deal with was figuring out a way of paying for all this because deficit spending was not a thing. You can't just spend money like we do today as far <laughs> and as hope the to eye pay it can off see. later. <laughs> you know, this somehow and this affected the British economy in years to come as well. It had a great effect on 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 Britain. This and that's is, one of those things we don't know, but you get a glimpse of it here. Yeah, you do. They really did a wonderful, wonderful job filming this. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the only thing I would have liked to, is to have found out more about why John Cavendish loaned the money to Mrs. Rakes, because you bring up this wonderful red herring and then you don't do anything with it. And I would have liked to seen more evidence of how jealous Mary Cavendish was, because again, I'm being told I'm not being shown, but that's so minor compared to how well thought out this was, how well set up this was. Even seeing Evie Howard's face, once you have seen it the first time, then when you go back and watch it the second time, or, you know, her face or uh, Alfred Inglethorpe's, you look at his face, there, you look at their facial expressions and you think, am I seeing what I thought I saw or do I see this slight contemptuous sneer I'm getting away with it. Mm -hmm. My plot, my evil plot is working. And you think about the betrayal in this, because Evie Howard has been part of the Cavendish household apparently for years. She's been Emily Cavendish Inglethorpe's closest companion, her personal secretary, her personal aide. She's done everything for this woman. And then she meets this man and basically says, oh, the person that I am closest to in the world you need to die so I can marry my boyfriend and be rich. And, you know, that's a really strong betrayal. That is. That is. Well, I think we've talked enough about this. We're going to continue on through our 
line of complete annotated books. So eventually we're going to get to The Secret Adversary and Murder on the Links and all the others, and we'll continue to talk about them. And we really appreciate you joining us. And remember, if you want to uh, meet us in person, go to our website, peschelpress.com, and we always list our upcoming events. So if you're in the central Pennsylvania area or maybe a little bit further afield and something's coming up and you can make it, come on out and see us. We're always happy to talk about Agatha. Absolutely. And continue to enjoy our shows, and we'll see you at the boobies. Bye-bye. Agatha Christie, she watched, is Teresa Peschel and Bill Peschel, produced by Bill Peschel. New episodes come out every week wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm backslash mystery and leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on Mystery She Watched, email peschel at peschelpress.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to peschel at peschelpress.com. And thank you for listening.